Okay, everybody. Good evening. <clears throat> tonight, tonight we're going to have another question and answer session, as some requested. Um, even though there's two back to back, but nevertheless, uh, I did get some questions ahead of time. Uh, I just have to pull them up one second. Uh, if you want to ask a question, go ahead and type it in the chat box. Um, I'll just address the questions that I saw um, on that were sent ahead of time by email. So I'll address those first, and then if you if you have any other questions, just type them in the chat box. Or if you sent one by email, I'll check that out shortly, and we'll get there. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so again, I won't mention the names of the people who asked the questions in case they don't want me to. Um, I'll just keep the questions anonymous, <laughs> unless I forget, as can happen. But um, Okay, one question was, Kabbalists always referring to crossing the barrier. Are there any indications of when a person is getting close? Any indicators of when a person is getting close, or does it happen all of a sudden? And can anyone cross the barrier? So, first of all, let's uh, just clarify what is meant by crossing the barrier. Um, first of all, I, I didn't even ask, is the sound okay? The sounds good? Yeah, okay, fine. So, um, basically, crossing the barrier is um, more or less as follows. Um, the, the truth is that the term crossing the barrier is a bit of a misnomer. There are many barriers. Um, um, and between level and level, between each level, each spiritual level, and there are myriads of spiritual levels, there is some kind of barrier or filter or... Um, uh, restriction that a person is unless until he's ready for a higher level is basically kept back from traversing over to the next level um, so are there any indicators yes there are uh, indicators um, first of all when a person is confronting a barrier the first indicator is that there's a certain area in a person's life which is uh seems to be inordinately difficult and um without any sort of rational explanation as to why it's so difficult um and the answer is that probably therein lies the person's uh particular um mode of service or what is necessary for that person to accomplish or to rectify in order to get to the next level. So um, the first indicator that there is a barrier is that there's something that's difficult to go or to, 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 to overcome. Uh, when you get close to it, does it happen all of a sudden? It depends. There's no hard, hard and fa fast rule. With these things, it could be a sudden uh, change. And it could be gradual. Most of the time, in most cases, it's actually a gradual change until suddenly, you know, you sort of turn around and you realize that uh, you're no longer in the first place. You've already moved on, moved up to a higher level. Uh, but it can happen suddenly as well. It depends on the depths of a person's, um, what's usually called in Kabbalah or in Jewish thought altogether, it's called tshuva. Shuva means returning in, in uh, realistic, because that's what it really means. It depends on the depth of a person's chuva and the depth of his returning, the depth of his feeling and passion and, uh, and energy when, uh, when he's doing it. If a person puts in an inordinate amount of energy to overcoming his barriers, it's likely that the, uh, he'll be able to traverse them suddenly, you know, like sort of just jump over them. But if a person only puts in uh, you know, a normal amount of effort, so it'll take more time. It'll be usually a gradual kind of change. Anyone can cross the barriers that they have in their own uh, lives. Uh, sometimes there are certain cases where a person actually needs a guide um, to, and not only in some cases, but it's very useful in many cases for a person to have a guide who can take them to the next level, someone who understands what it is that needs to be done even though that person that guide has never been in that particular place before but um an objective opinion an objective uh, pair of eyes um and ears and so on is always um very useful in getting to you know get, getting the next steps accomplished 
Um, so uh, there's a question here. What is the purpose of the blood sacrifice? Um, now, the when we say a blood sacrifice, the blood sprinkling of the blood on the altar was part of the sacrificial procedure. Uh, I just want to point out that the sacrifices are not done anymore since there's no temple and there hasn't been for almost 2,000 years. Um, so, yeah, for 2,000 years there hasn't been a temple. So we do not um, do any of these sacrifices, any of the sacrifices anymore. Um, but we do them uh, in a spiritual sense. Prayer is part of that sacrifice and the other things as well. Um, but it's a self-sacrifice more than it is a, um, a sacrifice of an animal. In fact, it's not a sacrifice of animals at all, but the sacrifice, if you wish, of the animal soul, of the animal part, the animalistic part of man. Now, the purpose of the sprinkling the blood, the blood is, the, uh, the Torah explains, Hadam hu hanefesh, that the blood is really the life force. In the blood is the life force of the soul. Uh, in other words, that which enlivens the body, which gives the body its, uh, its, its life. So, therefore, the blood is really the essence of the animal soul. And that's why the blood is put onto the altar, uh, because that is the elevation of the entire animal soul um, of that, uh, that, that particular animal. Or if we're talking about a human being, not that human beings were ever sacrificed, but rather now, when a person is sacrificing of himself, when you sacrifice of yourself, in other words, you bring to the table all of those things which need to be sacrificed, meaning elevated. The word korban, sacrifice, uh, really means to bring closer, right? Le karev. When one wants to bring oneself closer to God, so you have to get rid of the animalistic properties and make the divine properties within us uh, more um, dominant. And that was the purpose of the sacrifice of the blood, was to elevate the entire animal kingdom and by proxy, the entire animal soul of the human being. I say by proxy because it was done with animal blood instead of with human blood. Humans were never a sacrifice. The only time there was ever a concept, and it didn't happen, of human sacrifice was Isaac. And um, that was a test, but not an actual sacrifice. Uh, have the restrictions on Kabbalah been lifted, um, such as only men can teach, men and women study separately, and you achieve the same goals if you don't follow those, are there female Kabbalists? To all of those questions, the answer is uh, yes, but a qualified yes, and I'll explain what I mean. The restrictions on Kabbalah and the study of Kabbalah have been lifted, but there are various modes of Kabbalah, there's various uh, schools of Kabbalah. If we're talking about the classic schools of Kabbalah, um, the, some of the restrictions still remain because they are very powerful tools which, uh, misused, can cause a lot of harm to the person that uses them. And therefore, there are restrictions uh, against using them. However, the most modern form of Kabbalah, the one that's evolved really through the Baal Shem Tov, is open to everybody, and everybody can learn it, and not only everybody can learn it, but everybody should. Now, what's the difference between the Kabbalah of prior to the Baal Shem Tov and the Kabbalah after the Baal Shem Tov? So basically, the difference is as follows, and it's just a basic difference, uh, a fundamental difference. The Kabbalah prior to the time of the Baal Shem Tov was what you could, what, what's called in the, in the Kabbalah itself, Milamala Lamata, from above to below. In other words, the Kabbalist had to elicit the Kabbalistic powers and, and uh, let's call it the light that he seeks has to be elicited from above. And it has to be closed within various vessels that'll be, that are able to contain that Kabbalistic light or power or energy or whatever you want to call it, excuse me. That was up until the time of the Baal Shem Tov. What the Baal Shem Tov did was he changed the order. Instead of eliciting from above, drawing down into vessels, 
what he did was take this, the light that's already in the vessels and strip it of its coarseness, refine it, and thereby elevate it. So it's a whole different uh, approach. Instead of going from above to below, where there's a danger of making profane very holy things, the, uh, the method is from below to above where that restriction doesn't exist. That problem doesn't exist because it's a process of stripping away the outer layers in order to get to the inner core. Very much like the first question that we spoke about, crossing the barriers. That means peeling off the outer layers in order to get to the inner layers and eventually to the inner core. Well, that ca that's, there's no danger involved over there because one can only do it when one has the means and the method and the ability to be able to do such a thing. And therefore, there is no danger per se of such a thing. So the restrictions on Kabbalah have been lifted. Men uh, teach, but women teach as well. Um, now, it's just a function of uh, different chromosomes that men and women often teach in different ways. Not necessarily, but generally that is the way it is. Women, women teach it from much more of a, an experiential um, um, point of view, whereas men tend to uh, focus much more on the intellectual appreciation. That doesn't mean to say that women are not intellectual, it's just that the experience and emotion is more um, her realm than it is a male realm. And um, that doesn't mean to say that it's any less uh, holy or any, on the contrary, um, Abraham, for example, was told to listen to his wife, Sarah, because her level of uh, divine inspiration was on a higher level than his. And then he was told, listen to your wife, listen to the voice of Sarah, Sarah, because she is on a higher level. Um, and so there are female Kabbalists. Yes, there are female Kabbalists. Um, probably not as many as there are male Kabbalists. Um, there are fewer, but um, that, again, it's not a matter of um, female Kabbalists are kept away from it. It's just a matter of um, different kind of focus. Um, women generally tend to focus on uh, a whole different... Um, and correctly so, I think. Um, a, a woman is referred to in the Talmud as Ishto Zobeto. A woman is a man's home. A woman is the, is, the, is the home of the family. She's the home. She establishes the home. So very often women are more involved in, you know, in, in bringing up children and, 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 and doing things like that, which in and of themselves might not be as romantic as Kabbalah, but achieve a lot more. Teaching someone an idea is not quite the same as bringing another soul into the world. Um, in any event, that's the, uh, so there are female Kabbalists, but uh, not that many. Um, and any other questions from that uh, questioner, you could send by email. It doesn't have to be now. You could send it other times. If I have the time to answer, I will. All right, uh, another question over here. Um, Yes, there's a whole question about not allowing the flame on the altar to go out in the um, in this week's uh, in this week's Torah reading. That the flame, the fire, had to had to always be burning on the altar, and it wouldn't go out. Um, Um, I'm not exactly sure what, what it is that uh, this question, um, the question asks, is there a relation between this and the soul when it sits in, in hell, so to speak, to burn off the dross before it moves on to the next level? Um, I mean, that would make sense, but I, d I can't say I've ever seen anything about it, so I, I, don't, I, can't, I don't really know. Um, I don't know, but uh, this whole concept of the flame not going out, uh, that the soul, or the flame rather, on the altar is not, uh, you're not allowed to let it go out. 
um, the eternal flame, uh, that is basically the same is true of a person in uh, in their life. They have to keep the flame alive, and they have to constantly feed it and fan it, and uh, and so on and so forth. When they're living in this world. Um, okay, let me see if there are other questions there. No, there are no other questions there. Okay, I'm going to the chat box. Uh, let's see now. Um, Is the barrier in the first restriction the same thing? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the first restriction. You probably mean the Tzimtum Arishon, and no, it's not really the same thing. Uh, the first restriction is talking about from, well, the first constriction, if you want to put it like that, called the Tzimtum in Hebrew, that is between transcending creation and creation. Um and that's going from below to above, going up and um, uh, getting over the barriers. That would be the last barrier, not the first one. But um, is that is the first restriction the same thing as a barrier? It is the major, the major barrier. It is the major barrier. In other words, it's the it's that which separates beyond creation from creation, beyond. Um, it separates pure godliness from uh, from what would be uh, a finite world, infinite from finite. Is it possible to tra tra traverse that barrier? It is possible, but there's only um, there's only one way uh, that's described in the Kabbalah, and that is through the practical fulfillment of uh, the mitzvot, the commandments, the practical fulfillment of the commandments, and to a certain extent through learning uh, Torah as well. I um, hope that answers that. What's the level of the concept from Moses Court about at all, at all peeling the onion? Um, it was more, not so much peeling the onion, but laying further layers on the onion, I think, Martin. That would be the better way to say it, because, again, it's from above to below. Oops, I mentioned your name. Never mind. Um, it's from above to below, and therefore you, there's a constant situation of putting on further layers. Further layers, getting away further and further away from the core, which is what the whole system of uh, of the Ramak, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, was all about. Uh, how common of an event is it that individuals cross the barrier? It is common that individuals cross the barrier. Um, it's not uncommon. Uh, if you mean the very, very first barrier, well, that's le much less common, obviously, but transversing various barriers is a possibility. And um, not only is it a possibility, but it's kind of expected, you know, you're, so you're expected to transverse, to traverse the barriers and go from uh, level to level and from level to level. Uh, it sometimes demands a leap. Uh, which you could call a leap of faith, perhaps, but it demands a leap. In other words, uh, you know, you have to leave, you have to leave the ground on one side before you hit the ground on the other side, um, if you know what I mean. So sometimes it demands a leap. Um, next question: Could you comment on how we end up with our parents? Uh, does it go as I read? Tell us, soul chooses our parents, or well, there's a law of attraction. The way the soul's attracted to the parents. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I would say that that is uh, that is generally there is certainly a connection between the parents and the children. A child is usually born into that family. I wouldn't say that it's the soul chooses the parents so much, but that uh, the soul is directed to that situation where it can fulfill fulfill its tikkun, the rectification that it's coming down to this world for. So it's born into a family. Well, that that will be uh, most um, generally most the, the 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 best place for that soul to be. Now, does that mean that it's going to be an easy situation for that soul to do its rectification? No, it may be born into a very uh, adverse situation. But the 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 tikkun is obviously how to improve that adverse situation or how to transform it. Um, and therefore, for sure, a soul comes down into that family that, if you want to say, I don't, it's not really the right terminology, but the soul that it deserves, or the soul, uh, or the, the family that it deserves, or perhaps um, 
um, the family that it needs in order to get to uh, where it needs to get to now. Where it needs to get to might be in a positive sense, might be in a negative sense. In other words, moving as far away as possible from the, let's say, dysfunction of uh, such a family might also be a possibility. But um, generally, you have to know more specifics, like, you know, what family we're talking about, what situation, what kind of person is born into that family, and so on and so forth. Um, it also has to do with Gilgul, Gilgul meaning previous incarnations. Uh, so a person could be born into a family because it was part of that family previously, uh, in the previous incarnation, or again for the sake of a rectification. Uh, depending on every time I do that, I find the glory is the method uh, of below to above. Yes, exactly. That's the method of below to above. Um, um, for some reason, I'm not seeing this question clearly. Shimona T. Yeah, she's actually a Lanzmann of mine. She's also from South Africa, like I am. All South Africans are. <laughs> Um, but I don't see the rest of the question kind of got blocked by the next one for some reason. Um, I don't know why that is, but it did. Uh, let's see if we can fix it. No, it's still there. Yeah, she teaches with the rabbi. I'm not sure who rabbi that she teaches with, Shimona. Yeah, in any event. Okay, let's go uh, further. She's on the money. Um, you know, I haven't heard her lectures, but I've heard that she's very good. Um, all right, from, uh, okay, Sefer Yitzir, Arya Kaplan identifies the Sefirot as a five dimensions. Five dimensions, six. Space, time, and spiritual. Space, time, and soul. Kedem Alchut, spiritual. Chochman Bina is time. Past and presence. Three dimensions of human beings. there. Just with how we represent four or five dimensions kind of suggesting, but we hold in that dimension's constant I at a specific time and a specific level of spirituality and there. Consciousness can have a wide variety of emotions. Uh, whoa. Long question this. Um Okay, I think we'll be the adjustment of too much structure. Um, that's an interesting uh, hypothesis. Um, I'd have to think about that. Um, but the four or five dimensions, um, I would have to look at what Kaplan is talking about. Don't forget, Kaplan was a, Arya Kaplan was a scientist. He was a physicist. And he was very excited by dimensions. And <laughs> he passed away uh, many years ago already. But he was, he was a very great man. Uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying otherwise. But... Um, and his writings are very enlightening, but when he talks about dimensions, um, one has to know exactly what he means. I'm not, I mean, there's three dimensions, um, dimensions of space, one dimension of time, and if the truth is, Kamalah talks about ten dimensions. Each sphira is a different dimension, and then there's transcendent dimensions as well, the dimension of Keter. Uh, so each of these dimensions, in fact, in string theory, the latest in physics, string theory, they also have 10 dimensions, uh, interestingly enough. But uh, how those dimensions work in terms of what we know, as far as the Kabbalah is concerned, space is only one dimension, it's not three dimensions. Yes, it has four sides or six sides, six sides, uh, you know, north, south, west, east, and above and below. The six sides of space, but space is itself only one dimension as far as, as one of the dimensions. Time is another dimension, as, um, as was just pointed out. There's space, there's time, and there's soul, being. And in being, there are, uh, in, in, in and of themselves, several dimensions. Uh, so it um, can subdivide in different ways, but um, a little complex for now. Uh, what these other what these other dimensions are uh, above to below again. It's a little confused. Yes. When we're talking about the process, we mentioned in the last uh, in the last class, also a question and answer session, that there is a uh, there are three 
uh, schools or three uh, eras of Kabbalah. The first era of Kabbalah is uh, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, or was the, was was really encapsulated, or was was put into um, it was systematized by Moshe Cordovero, but it began from the time really of the Zohar, from the Zohar all the way through to uh, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, and that talks about Hishtal Shalut. Hishtal Shalut means the chaining down of being from uh, infinite to finite, the entire process, the entire process of uh, of creation from above to below. Now, then kind of along that reason, he spoke about uh, Hitlab Shut, uh, sort of interactive, um, the interactive side of things, and the Baal Shem Tov spoke about the uh, intuitive or the um, inspirational aspect of Kabbalah. But when we're talking about above to below, so you could be talking about Hishtal Shalut, in other words, the creation and, and chaining down of the worlds. Or we could be talking about in Kabbalistic meditation, the idea is to elicit the um, highest levels of godliness and bring them down from level to level and level to level until they're closed within the vessels of the physical world. Now that can, as I mentioned, be dangerous because you're bringing very lofty things down to very coarse, what could be very coarse vessels. And that could either sort of blow the vessel up, uh, as there were many cases of, of, of people who went uh, a little crazy. We know the story of uh, the four sages who entered the orchard. In other words, they entered very deep into this Kabbalistic meditation. And the only one that came out whole was Rabbi Akiva. One died, one went crazy, one became an apostate. Uh, the only one that came out okay was Rabbi Akiva because of his intentions when he went in. His intention going in was to come uh, to come out again. Uh, in other words, to to, to uh, go up and come down, to, uh, to reach the highest pinnacles of spirituality and bring them down back into the world. But the system of the Arizal, the meditations of the Arizal of Rabbi Yitzhak Luria and his disciples and uh, subsequent um, sages, as well as the teachings of the Zohar, are all there to elicit light from above and invested in the person and in the world around him. The system of the, that's called from above to below. The system of the Baal Shem Tov is to take the world as we find it around us and strip it of its coarseness, refine it of its coarseness, remove the coarseness and find the inner core, which is all godly. It's a different approach. Uh... Yeah, with Manus Friedman, um, I assume that that was Shimona and Manus Friedman. Yep, um, probably. Okay, um, circular and linear effects are operating simultaneously. We run and return, producing the coexistence of opposites, good and bad simultaneously. And most of us are. Yeah, can I send and descend simultaneously? Can you ascend and descend simultaneously? Hmm. Um, I would have really have to examine some sources about that. It seems to me that they're mutually exclusive. Um, I could be wrong, but that's why it looks to me now, but... Can you ascend and descend at the same time? Well, in a sense, yeah. I mean, there, there is uh, 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 an expression in Kabbalah that goes, you read a Torah Aliyah, descent for the sake of ascent. But the descent is nevertheless descent. It's not ascent. It's for the sake of ascent. It's for the sake of rising afterwards. But it's not necessarily at the time rising. It's descending. Um, and sometimes a person goes through what's called a nefila, he goes through a fall, in order to give him the ability to transcend the fall, to rise again. And um, 
without using um, artificial means. Um, without using artificial means, what I mean by artificial means, I mean drugs and, um, and things like that. And I might even mean prescription drugs, you know, like uh, over-the-counter or prescription drugs that they put one in a better mood and uh, so on and so forth. A person sometimes finds himself in a much bear in a, uh, in a situation where he's broken. And I mentioned this last time, actually. Um, but in order to, that's the birthing school stool, at the same time that it is a, uh, a spiritual or emotional low, at the same time that's a stool for giving birth to the next level, as we mentioned last time. Um, um, I mean, most of us are, you know, bad and good at the same time in the sense that, you know, we're, uh, we, we strive to do good and we want to do good, but at the same time, sometimes we do some pretty stupid things. Uh, not necessarily at the very same moment, but in the same person. Um, we're all schizophrenic to a certain extent. We have a yet to talk, yet to horror, a, a good in, a inclination and an inclination towards evil, inclination towards good, inclination towards evil, and both of them contained within us. That's what the Tanya is all about. The beginning of the Tanya discusses this whole idea of, uh, of really what you could be called, uh, in a sense, schizophrenia. Yes, you are schizophrenic. We're all schizophrenic to a certain extent. Obviously not clinically schizophrenic, but we're, at the same time that we know what's good for us and we strive most of the time to do what's good for us, often uh, we don't um, actually maintain that. We... Um, um, you know, we, uh, you know, uh, listen, you know, a person wants to be a good person, but he sometimes loses his temper. A person wants to be a good person, but he sometimes, uh, you know, skips a prayer or, uh, or doesn't do a mitzvah or doesn't give charity or whatever, you know, I mean, uh, we're humans. At the same time, again, it's not necessarily at exactly the same time, but uh, we tend to oscillate between the two um the two poles of good and bad, although hopefully the preponderance of uh, the oscillation is on the side of good. But yes, uh, that's what the whole Tanya is about, actually. Uh, all cards on the table. Uh, okay, let me just answer another question first that came in first. Uh, and also there were high priests found in a coiled spiral on the left and right bottom corners of the outer front surface. I really don't know. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with this. Uh, sorry. Um, I don't really know how to answer you on that one. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Okay, sorry, I don't know, maybe rosary, uh, I don't know, uh, I really don't know, I'm not familiar with it. Okay, uh, let's see, next, um, all cards on the table, recently part of a group where the leader claimed to have passed the Mahsom. I think it's called the Mahsom. In addition, other than the group, they require the same attainment. He said he attained full final correction. Uh, I left the group because I think he's delusional. <laughs> and he said he's messed up as a form of idolatry. Any comments? Yeah, sounds pretty much like that. Um, what evidence would be apparent in this person's persona? What evidence would be is that the person would talk very little about their accomplishments. Uh, that's the first evidence that a person is really... Um, on a higher spiritual level. He wouldn't talk much about his own accomplishments unless it was absolutely necessary for whatever reason. And then humility would definitely be a sign of, um, of a person on a higher spiritual level. <clears throat> um, um, he has attained his final correction, baloney. It's not going to happen until the Messianic era until Messiah comes, until Mashiach comes. 
Um, so I think you did the right thing leaving the group. Um, you know, I don't know the person concerned, so, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know who it is, but um, it sounds suspicious. Let's put it that way. It sounds pretty suspicious. When people talk to start, start to talk about themselves as, you know, being the world expert, you know, it's just the same as if you're... Uh, you know, I, I, uh, when, when it's the same as if someone wants to give you a stock tip and then starts to tell you how many millions they've made, and they'll sell you the stock tip for only forty nine dollars. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> if someone's made millions, you know that, um, then uh, you know they're not going to go for your forty nine bucks for your uh, for the stock tip or whatever it is. If you know what I mean, that, that kind of thing. It doesn't sound to me that it's. Now, it could be authentic. I don't know the person, but um, I would be I would be very suspicious. Um, and to say that you've transversed all the barriers uh, and this person has not been heard of by certainly not by me, and I know very accomplished Kabbalists who would never say that about themselves. Um, uh, you know, so uh, take it for. Um, if I would, you know, if you would ask me if I would want to opt into uh, to that person's group, I would uh, politely decline. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Okay. Uh, could I establish a meditation scenario where I sit at the computer with appropriate head and hand gear, and the names of God are other floats in dramatic way or other floats in dramatic ways? Slow, fast, near, close, fuzzy, clear, change colors, etc. Around my head. <laughs> you could try it. Uh, it sounds like it's an interesting uh, thing. Um, let me just point out, I mean, uh, you know, if, if you feel you would like to try such a thing, uh, you, could, you could try it. I, I personally don't go for gimmicks too much. Um, and I'm not saying what, you, what you're discussing is a gimmick, it might just be a method, uh, and a useful method, but usually the, you know, the, the, the methods that are proposed are much more blood, sweat, and tears than there are uh, gimmicks, if you know what I mean. There are certain Kabbalists who give uh, tools um, that are powerful, intrinsically powerful, um, and, you know, they, they do work um, to an extent. But as with anything, if you, uh, you know, you can have the tool, if you don't have the skill to use it, um, it could either be useless to you or it could even be damaging, uh, you know, just to think of, a, um, of an example, um, a scalpel. You know, if you get a very sharp uh, scalpel, uh, it's a very fine tool. You have to know exactly where you're cutting. Uh, you know, you can experiment with things and whatever. The operation might not come out exactly so um, successful if one doesn't know what one's doing. Um, so, uh, you know, um, okay. Um... You know, again, I would be, I would be a little bit hesitant um, as far as that's concerned. Okay. Um, the, yeah, the brain's not wired that way. All right. I think it is, but it's usually fear that drives so-called bad. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure that that's correct in my assessment, anyway. Um, it could be greed, it could be just bad people. I mean, there are bad people in the world, you know. They're bad people. It may be sometimes that fear drives the bad, but uh, it's not always fear, I don't think. So that person said that he's the Bala Sulam reincarnated. Uh -huh. I wonder if the Bala Sulam would agree with that. <laughs> Is he a religious person? Is he a person that's observant? Uh, if not, then um, I don't know. I have my doubts. Um, uh, you know, again, I don't know who we're talking about here, so it's probably not. Uh, it's not really worth discussing it, I guess. Moses didn't brag or boast, I guess. No, he did not. Uh, it says in the in the Torah itself that Moses is the most humble uh, 
person around. Most humble man around. Uh, tests of power. I'm not sure what you're referring to, Galen. Uh, oops, I'm not sure. What, yeah, I guess everyone can see it anyway. Um, and I'm kidding about what? I don't know. Um, the person makes claims that he's the only Kabbalist. <laughs> okay, there you go. So now I think you... Uh, you, you, you can see where this is coming from. Um, no, there are many Kabbalists in the world, and, um, you know, he's the only Kabbalist. Uh, uh -huh. Does he read Hebrew? <laughs> Aramaic? Um, be careful of such claims. Again, I don't know who the person is, but... It sounds very suspicious. Uh, the Rebbe said that technology should be used to expand a Jewish consciousness. So it would appear impossible for someone to relate their mystical experience so that you present it in the computer and others will partially gain some of that experience. Why? Because mystical experiences are not described outside of specific experience. It's a real challenge of virtual reality. One of the problems is that these experiences are limited to a small group as to how to expand the experience. Yeah. I hear. Uh, yeah, you know, it could be. I mean, uh, you know, you could certainly use a computer in, uh, in useful ways. Uh, the way that you mentioned, I'm not sure that it would be that effective, but you could try. See what happens. Um, yeah, it might be fair or not enough, but it might just be greed. I don't know. I mean, why try to reduce everything to fear? It's, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of a reductionist approach. I, I don't personally agree with that, um, but uh, you could perhaps understand that that way. Uh, what is hatred? Is hatred also fear? Uh, you know, what is laziness? Also fear. Uh, you know, there's lots of negative qualities. Do I eat Chicago pizza, Lumel Nidi's pizza on North Wales? <laughs> Lumel Nadi's? No, I personally don't. <laughs> uh, I only eat kosher, so I'm not even sure who Lumel Nadi is, but... Um, if it's a kosher pizza place, I don't know. I don't go downtown that often. And certainly not for pizza. <laughs> not that I have anything against it, you understand. But uh, um, I don't need it that often. In any, uh, in any event, let's continue. Right at the most mundane level of above to below, the application of the work of a result to everyday life. Yes, that would be from above to below. Up to below. Trying to apply the teachings of the result uh, in everyday life, yes. Uh, you have flown out. Okay. Um, not all cheese is kosher. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, probably most of it is, but, um, okay. And what about if they make it in ovens with, uh, you know, may meat at the same time, or whatever. Okay. Um, I don't see how that's an example of above to below. This is a private message, but I, 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 I don't... I don't get it. Um, so I'm not going to say it out loud, but... Okay, any other questions, folks? Did ancient greats like Moses eat kosher? Yes, they did. All the kosher laws are found in the Bible. I mean, they didn't eat with a kosher stamp on it, but they made their own food, so... Uh, Buddha on the road thing that you speak about? Uh, I don't think I ever spoke about Buddha on the road, but I'm um, not sure what you mean, but... Um, yeah, Afraid of Purim, a happy and very uh, joyous Purim. The fast starts tonight, well, tomorrow morning early, and... Um, then we roll right into Purim, and then <laughs> if we do it right, we'll roll right out of it and into the week. <laughs> it's a custom to get a little, uh, um, how shall I say, um, well, drunk, I suppose is the right word, <laughs> on Purim. Um, it's a fast going into Purim, the fast of Esther, it's called. Um, Lots of fun afterwards. I'm eating now. Good. All right. Inebriated. Oh, there you go. Yeah, inebriated. <laughs> right. Um, 
yeah, I mean, uh, some people go a little bit overboard, but uh, listen, it's all in the spirit of Purim, with the emphasis on spirit, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, true, right? Yeah, now I understand what you mean. Yeah, correct. You can eat up to, it depends on every area, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit different. Uh, yes, you can eat up until what's called Alot HaShachar. Alot HaShachar means dawn. And to just before dawn in Chicago, dawn is, uh, according to at least one system, it's 5.22 or so. Uh, others place it a little bit later, 5.30 something. But um, yeah, 5.22 in Chicago. Uh, other places have, um, you know, according to their, when dawn is not the same everywhere. All right. So I don't think you can tell the difference between Mordechai and Haman, so you see good in all things. Right, uh, there is, so it says in the Code of Jewish Law that a person should drink enough that he can't tell the difference between Mordechai and Haman. Now, how can you not tell the difference between good and evil? Um, what it means, obviously, and that's the way it's explained, what it means is that whether things come about in a positive way or things come about in a negative way, we always try and extract the good from it and see the good in it and treat it as... Um, if it's not revealed good, then it's an opening to good right now that, 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 that has not yet been revealed. Let's put it that way. Right. Uh, in the old days of artificial intelligence, computers had to create was to recreate the decision-making of oil during experts or doctors for diagnosis. For instance, the mystic experience of a sage, the difference is probability. We can agree on diagnosis, but not necessarily what the mystical experience is not predictable. True reality is a probability distribution. <laughs> um, true reality, I don't think, is a probability distribution, but um, um, I don't know how. <laughs> it's a rather complicated observation here. Um, Martin, I like to keep things simple. <laughs> Let's put it in simple in simple terms. Uh, why do we have to bother with artificial intelligence? We have our own true artificial intelligence computer. It's very useful. I use one all the time. And we use it for all kinds of calculations. But what we have to develop is our own innate intelligence. And that is uh, the goal. That is the goal. So... Um, whether it... Um, uh, and it helps get further in consciousness. Yeah, you can. You can use computer. You know, use a computer just like any other tool to get further in consciousness. Yes, um, well, I'm, not, I'm not arguing. But simplify, simplify. You know, uh, um, the utmost simplicity is usually the most profound. The more the simpler something is, the more profound it is. Usually, the more complex it becomes. That means that it's been, you know, um, covered over with layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of thought and so on and so forth, and ultimately it just becomes confusion, I think. Now, I'm not saying in your particular case, I'm just saying that's the way it is. Um, you have to understand first in order to simplify, uh, and that's the problem. Um, well, I think simplifying is the solution to the problem, really. But... <laughs> Uh, why fast? How long? For what reason? It's called the fast of Esther. Um, it is a commemorative fast when uh, Haman wanted to destroy the Jewish people. So Esther, um, Mordechai, who was her uncle, sent. Uh, she was married to the king, and um, Haman had made a decree, and uh, a decree to destroy the uh, basically to destroy the Jewish people, and um, uh, Mordechai asked Esther to intervene with the king since she was the queen and nullify the decree and she had to figure out how to do it uh, in an effective way and so she said I'm going to fast and I want all of you to fast as well it was three days not just one day not just um, really two thirds of a day um, so that's why we um, that's why we fast, to commemorate the fast that she and uh, the Jewish people at that time, all of them, 
faster. It's commemorative. Um, St. Gordon's is in three days. I don't think it will last for three days. Although there are, um, or were, I can't say I know people today who do this, but there were people who would fast from week to week. In other words, they would fast from Sabbath to Sabbath. They would only eat on the Sabbath. They would fast the rest of the week, the whole week. And not eating at night. They wouldn't eat. That's it. They eat on Sabbath. That's it. But we don't, we don't have the physical strength for that anymore, nor is there any necessity to even... Uh, to, to try that. It's definitely not definitely not healthy and uh, can be very detrimental to one's health. Um, yes. <laughs> all right. Have a good Purim, all of you. Um, <laughs> I should not need alcohol to be able to differentiate between good and evil. No, I think alcohol prevents one from doing that, quite frankly. But to be able to find the good in everything, one sometimes needs a little bit of a boost. But uh, don't worry, I'm not going to get. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to get completely beside myself. I, I don't like to do that. Um, okay. We use alcohol to rectify Adam's sin exactly. Uh, be safe, everybody. Have a good night. And uh, yes, everybody's welcome. Um, does anyone want me to put this?